and and uh, so thanks to the uh, conference organizers and uh, also to the Plexus editors who I see are here, uh, which is great. Um, UN asked me to talk for just a couple of minutes about medical humanities at UCI. So I hope to provide you with a little information about uh, what medical humanities is and why it's important. So medical humanities is a field that seeks to bring together the arts, humanities, medicine, and healthcare in the study of health and illness. Its fundamental assumption is that to fully comprehend the meaning of health and illness, it is essential to think critically about the body, uh, about the profession that purports to treat the body, and also the structural composition uh, of the institutions and society within which efforts at healing occur. It also asserts that to engage with the healthcare professions, it's necessary to understand with discernment and insight, but without judgment, the human condition in all its many faceted complexity. Those of us working in this field believe that disciplines such as literature and narrative medicine, which we're talking about this evening, visual and performing arts, bioethics, science and technology studies, medical anthropology, history of medicine, philosophy and cultural studies, all of these present underutilized pathways for addressing these questions. So the University of California, Irvine is fortunate to have a robust range of medical humanities initiatives on campus. The School of Humanities houses a medical humanities minor which has over 40 students currently declared, as well as a graduate emphasis in medical humanities. In addition, the Center for Medical Humanities, directed by Professor Jim Lee, sponsors a distinguished lectureship series, as well as offers graduate student grants and faculty seed money in medically humani uh, medical humanities related areas. Um, you're all familiar, I hope, with the Campus Club, Healing Through Humanities, uh, which has done such incredible work in fostering medical humanities at the undergraduate level, level by holding regular meetings to discuss the intersection of humanities and medicine, and also initiating many community outreach activities. Uh, the School of Medicine is proud of its small but vigorous program in medical humanities. We offer required and curric uh, elective curriculum in medical humanities across all four years of medical school. In addition, we support medical student and undergraduate research in medical humanities and sponsor a variety of events. Of course, you all know that both the campus and the School of Medicine have their own journals of arts and humanities, the Scribe and Plexus, which focus on original creative works by students that address topics of health and illness suffering and well-being. This year's themes for the scribe and plexus are respectively resilience and emergence. To me, both of these themes are especially relevant to the times we live in and the times we have just lived through. The twin viruses of pandemic and authoritarianism that have threatened our society this past year have shown us the need for solidarity with our fellow human beings, commitment to an equitable and just healthcare system and society, as well as the need for constant vigilance to protect our democracy. Resilience, uh, the theme for the scribe, is of course the ability to recover from difficulties, to spring back with elasticity, and is therefore a critical element uh, enabling us to move forward. And I think this is where emergence comes into play out of the rubble of over 580,000 deaths out of the tragedy of repeated police killings of black and brown individuals. We want not only to return to what was, but to go further. We must determine to go beyond simple healing to radical transformation, to commit not only to building back 
to, but to building back better. As the president of Stanford University, Marc Tessier Levigne recently wrote, the arts give us comfort in times of hardship, connection and isolation and new insights into our own experience. The arts can also help us imagine a better future for our world. I believe that the art and writing that we will see and hear this evening can inspire us to do precisely that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. And now I'll hand it off to Dr. Nguyen to say a few words. Thank you, Tian. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, I'm a family medicine physician here at UCI. Um, you know, actually, art really does give comfort. You know, for me as a physician working in, in this time, um, I'm actually really fortunate to have our department chair, Dr. Huck, um, who you meet later give us support for Dr. Shapiro and I to work with student faculty in bringing hope and wellness to the community. You know, of these times where um, we were working with patients with COVID, um, there were an hour a month on an evening where I really get to escape. And I, I, I got a chance to be a poet and not a physician where I didn't have to wear my N95, didn't have to gown up. And I really had that time to reconnect and then find new meaning in my work and, 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 and get to connect with, with other physicians in the community, get to work with medical students and undergraduate students on these projects. Um, it really helped me see you know, my work, my patients and my students in a more positive and productive and joyful way. Um, and and from, from those interactions, um, especially with, with some of these students in, in Plexus and HTH, um, we formed new relationship. We created new project and more research and more findings to, to help the community. Um, so as a physician and educator, I think it, it brings a lot of meaning to my work and my personal life. And I hope that that can um, be carried on for the young medical students or undergrad students here as well. So thank you for having these wonderful projects. And, and I just love how they work together. All right, thank you so much to Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Shapiro for their introductions. So I'll also be introducing myself. So my name is Yuan Mai. I am the co-editor in chief for the scribe and I will also be one of the co-hosts for this event. Uh, team, would you also like to introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Hi everyone, my name is Tian and I'm also one of the co-editor in chief for the scribe and I'll also be co-hosting this event. And would the Plexus uh, leaders also like to introduce themselves? Hi everyone, I'm Ashley. I am one of the co-editors for Plexus this year. And we're so grateful to Yuan and Tian for planning this symposium and for having us feature tonight. Hi, my name is Ken Schmidt. I'm also a one of the co-editors in chief for, for Plexus. And just like Ashley said, we're very grateful for this event and um, we really look forward to it. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to the first portion of our event, and that will be the scribe speakers. So tonight, I'm really excited. We have um, several students from UCI who um, had their works accepted to the scribe, and today we're going to be featuring them. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the scribe. So I hope you can see my screen. I'm going to present really quick. All right, sweet. So this is our organization, the Scribe, and we are a medical humanities publication at UCF. So just a quick um, rundown of who we are and what we do. We generally get accepted work from UCI students and, you know, just editing throughout the month, we get so many works from students who are actively involved in the healthcare field or they've had just encounters with medicine that they like to share. And what I really like about this is that they don't just verbally say, they're able to express themselves in multiple ways. So what we do is 
We accept their works in narratives, poems, visual artwork, such as paintings or drawings. And we also accept photographs. And we just had so much, so many fantastic works that we've received this year. And I have no doubt we'll receive many more in the future years, but all we want to do is just um, have students the ability to just share their experiences about medicine and illness and well-being. And we want to especially thank our team, um, our executive team from Brittany, Tia, and Marvin, Lauren, and Monica, as well as our editors um, for making this happen. Paolo, Joseph, Rachel, Kelly, Lynn, Mara, Kathy, Hannah, and Isaac. Um, you guys, this would not have been possible without you guys for the countless hours of work that you've put into editing all the pieces, recruiting submissions, and um, publicizing this event. Thank you so much for your hard work. And lastly, we'd like to thank our scribe advisors to Dr. Joanna Shapiro, as well as Dr. Castillo. Um, the scribe was started three years ago with the help of our lovely advisors. And thank you so much for making this happen. Oh, and, and yes. as on a on, yeah, on a final note, these are all the works that have um, have been accepted to the scribe this year, and these are all really fantastic works. Um, if I could, I would show all of them, but you know, just due to time restraints, we will be having six speakers today, six wonderful speakers, and. That's, that's it, yeah, let's transition to the script speakers. So our first student speaker of this evening is Cindy Seha. She's gonna be presenting a poem titled World of Strings. Hi everyone, so I'm Cindy Seha. I'll be reading World of Strings today. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. Roll the strings. There once was a young girl, her given name, Holly. She had the sweetest demeanor, always so happy and jolly. But how could she not be in her cheerful world? All around there were strings, long and short, straight and curled. But what are these strings? She one day inquired. They're so cheerful and beautiful, a true sight to admire. There are pink ones and blue ones and orange ones too. There are striped ones and dotted, and ones colored like goo. But what are these strings, is what I want to know. All the grown-ups have them, and I'm yet to grow. I'd like purple ones for myself, if I may. Purple's my favorite. I'll wear them day after day. Hush now, my child, and I'll tell you the story. The strings aren't for children, so you might find it boring. Boring? Oh, bother. How could that ever be? Just look at them dancing in the wind with such glee. Look at your strings, mother. How gaily they sway. I'd like some of my own. How much more can I say? Look in this window, my dear, and what do you see? The baker, no doubt. No one is happy as he. He needs any pools at he needs any pools at his dough with delight. A smile on his face, always happy and bright. Yes, I know, dear mother. A happy baker he is. The most pleasant baker, the title is his. But what of these strings? Please do not stray. I'd quite like some strings. Let's keep distractions at bay. Look closer, my girl. Look at his strings. See how they drop as far down as his knees? Yes, he has long strings. Of this all are aware. He has the large he has the longest in town. He looks near to a bear. See how they pull on his limbs as he bakes, directing his movements, creating his cakes? See how they pull his cheeks back in a smile, forcing an expression not done in a while. I hadn't noticed this, mother. What do you mean? The movements aren't his, but rather the strings? The man hasn't baked or even smiled in years. His truest expression is that of swallowed back tears. Holly stayed quiet, her mind lost in thought, confused and distressed, her head now felt hot. But what of the strings? Why won't they let him move? The strings are what guide him. It's he who disproved. How long has it been since he really moved last? Upwards of 10 years since his darling wife passed. Holly's eyes watered, her heartstrings gave a twang. A lump formed in her throat, her limbs seemed to hang. You see, dearest Holly, as one grows with age, life becomes harder, at times feels like a cage. We create strings and sadness as a way to help cope with a world large and troubling, one lacking in hope. Do you see now, my Holly, why you should be glad to lack strings? You're happy and young, one who still laughs and sings. 
So be not envious of strings of any color, size, or style. Remember that their owners are all tied together with a smile. Part two. With a heavy heart weighing, Holly entered the store. She went straight for the counter, leaving her mom at the door. Excuse me, Mr. Harold, she said to the baker. Your weekly plums putting on the counter, he answered in a tone miserable enough to break her. No, it's not that, answered she in a rush. I wanted to talk to you about a matter untouched. The baker looked up from his work, although not the quickest, his sorrowful eyes unable to feign any interest. What is it, young miss, that you desire? Another pastry, perhaps? Anything for the buyer? No, Mr. Harold, there's nothing like that. I just want to talk to you and have a nice little chat. See, you've been my baker as long as I can remember, in all my four years, every January through December. I've never quite said it, but I've always believed it. When it comes to best baker, you're the most fit. Every week I have your pastries and every week I'm delighted. And when I take your trees to school, all my friends get excited. Your donuts are the softest and your tarts are the freshest. Your hot chocolate leaves me drooling, without a doubt the pleasantest. So you see, Mr. Harold, the point of my speech is to say that I appreciate you. You're this town's gem, a real peach. And with that, Holly finished, a grin on her face. Mr. Harold blinked his eyes in an odd sort of daze. Then something magical happened, which Holly had never seen. A dozen of Mr. Harold's strings disappeared in a gleam. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. That was wonderful. That's was awesome. <laughs> okay, so for our next speaker, we have Maggie Lajoie. She is a photo, and it's going to be titled Glimpses of San Francisco. All right, hi. Uh, so I took two photos of different uh, low income neighborhoods within San Francisco, um, both of which represent the strength and resilience of the people that live there. Uh, so I'll just be describing the photos and uh, explaining their, their meaning. Uh, so the first photo was of the Tenderloin District um, taken soon after the cessation of the George Floyd protests. Uh, and this photo embodies the mourning of the Tenderloin, uh, which, if you didn't know, is a district that is often called the most in need neighborhood of the city, uh, which is mainly home to low income people and people of color. Um, so in, in this photo, there are steamy streets, empty sidewalks, and uh, really beautiful recently painted murals, uh, which is all that's left from uh, these vibrant protests. And this just represents the resilience of those who live in a poverty ridden district uh, that's adjacent to some of the most wealthiest neighborhoods in the entire country. Uh, and then the next photo is of Chinatown uh, where the streets are usually full of both natives and tourists uh, shopping at markets, eating at restaurants. However, the pandemic has obviously changed this dynamic uh, since now these streets are only filled with locals uh, making trips from their apartments to gather food for the week. Uh, and, and this is because unlike other neighborhoods in San Francisco that are still heavily tracked by tourists, uh, visitors are completely unseen in a neighborhood of a population that's blamed for the creation of COVID-19. So uh, Chinatown residents live with the repercussions of anti-Asian rhetoric uh, and racism, uh, ultimately losing business from visitors and isolating themselves from the rest of the city. Uh, but yet they still choose to continue to live life as they always have, uh, doing their routine and just keeping Chinatown one of the greatest cultural centers in, in the world. Uh, so if you look at these two photos, you'll, you'll definitely see the Tenderloin in Chinatown have certainly been through a difficult time this year. Uh, though the residents of these districts have done an impeccable job at surviving both physically and culturally. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. It's a very beautiful fall. Our next speaker is going to be Kayla Tang Lee, she's going to be reading an excerpt from her narrative, 
and it's titled Don't Catch the Yellow. Hello, everyone. My name is Kayla Lee, and I will be sharing my narrative or an excerpt from my narrative called Don't Catch the Yellow. Don't Catch the Yellow is a narrative that touches upon many different aspects of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, the ongoing and current Asian American discrimination and how that may cause a rejection of one's own culture. And secondly, the larger discrimination against the Black community through the usage of the model minority. After World War II, Asian Americans were not the main target of discrimination. And so the COVID-19 pandemic hit the Asian American community a lot harder than expected. However, we as Asian Americans should recognize how the usage of the model minority has affected other minority groups. For too long, we have taken advantage of the status to give us a place within American society. And I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has given us the opportunity to recognize our faults and realize that Asian American discrimination sits within a larger discrimination against the Black community. The following is an excerpt from my narrative that I feel best describes this message. It had been five years since Sarah moved into the neighborhood. She remembered the gaping eyes and bewildered gazes. You're Asian, right? You must be smart. Play a song on the piano for us, they had once said. Admittedly, she had indulged in their admiration for her. Neither popular nor an outcast, Sarah settled well into her new community. Being different didn't matter so long as she could take advantage of it. Standing by the kitchen counter with trembling fingers, her eyes wandered over to the vase of sunflowers that her mother had picked from the garden the day before. Normally, she would have enjoyed their lively appearance, but today, something about their obnoxious shades of yellow disgusted her. Golden hues of arrogance and conceited behavior enveloped the ray florets to such an extent that Sarah could no longer suppress herself. What false pride and satisfaction was worth it now that you have been isolated from soil, she wondered. The clock chimed into the next hour as she stood, ridiculed by a surge of harassing thoughts. Why am I like this? There must be something wrong with me. There's something very wrong with me. Her mind pounded in rhythm to the buzzing of her pestering phone like the incessant beating of a bass drum. Each notification was a reminder that her heritage was a plague to the rest of humanity, a lesson that her kind would disorder the safety of true Americans, her race, her people, the audacity of the Chinese, those dirty Chinese, she hated being Chinese. And so it happened without warning, her quivering hands now hardened by disoriented passion, flung themselves onto the unsuspecting heads of innocent sunflowers. She yanked and ravaged as petals spiraling downwards admitted their defeat to her desecration. A jolt of bitterness pinched and stung her senses, but the loathing remarks remained potent. The vase, clinging desperately to the stems, teetered one last time before its inevitable shatter. Petals of grief and shards of sorrow dripped like tears onto the cold ground, but that delicate yellow had yet to leave. However soaked and torn, it didn't move. Thank you for taking the time to listen to an excerpt from my narrative. I hope you're all able to read my narrative in full when you get the chance to, as I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Our next speaker is going to be presenting a poem. His name is Derek Chang, and he will be presenting when ammo weighs more than human soul. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Derek. I'm currently a first year student at UC Irvine. So uh, my poem, When Ammo Weighs um, More Than Human Soul is about the uh, health disparities before, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the pandemic yanked away the cover that the United States healthcare system hides itself, itself in. And um, it desperately needs to be fixed, but it's currently um, propped up by duct tape. And uh, we can we have seen a, an um, overt preference at the government level to fund the military industrial complex rather than in the health and well-being of Americans. And out of all the other developed nations, why should we Americans accept this half image of life and fall prey to, uh, to the fear of inevitably succumbing to the system that is supposed to heal? So. Um, my poem, uh, when the title is When Ammo Weighs More Than Human Soul. When ammo weighs more than human soul, its weight and gold funds the devil's toll, who comes at night with a swifting dive, the way he took those who can't afford life. When ammo weighs more than human soul, unleashed is death we can't control, where we could control what we seem to let go, to God's embrace they go. When ammo weighs more than human soul, Hospitals replaced with bullet holes. Crowds and crowds would shout and cry. 
while rulers scheme in their Versailles. When ammo weighs more than human soul, who knew life cost nothing more than a battle's fought with grand bankroll to the philanthropy sufferers go? When ammo weighs more than human soul, dreams are replaced and will be their dole before commanders on the battlefield are valued more than those at heel. When ammo weighs more than human soul, those who suffer are solely pros, accepted a half as much of life in this lore, only to be hurt no more. Thank you. That concludes my poem. Thank you, Derek, for sharing your poem. Okay. Our next presentation is going to be a visual arts piece. Um, so Lauren Cheng will be presenting and she'll be presenting um, a lotus in all of us. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lauren Cheng and I'm a fourth year. Um, so this piece was originally inspired in high school by an art assignment to just draw a skeleton. Um, and after coming up with a good composition, I ended up putting my own twist on it. Um, so what I wanted uh, to express is that everyone experiences hardships in life and um, it doesn't matter their social statuses. Uh, and I just want to express something really human that is the shared experience of struggling and staying resilient against different hardships. The inspiration for this piece was my own struggles with mental health during high school. And even when it feels like you're drowning and life keeps kicking you, there's still something inside of us that keeps us moving. Uh, just like the lotus in the skeleton, um, we can grow out of muddy waters and shine brightly, whether it's for ourselves, better opportunities, or even other individuals that we care about. Uh, the sole act of getting up and walking forward is an accomplishment on its own. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And finally, our last presentation for a described portion of the event. This is going to be a poem and Lauren Severo will be presenting. She'll be presenting 50 times a day. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Severos and um, I wrote 50 times a day and it's a poem that came about when I realized during the height of the pandemic how I was washing my hands so many times over and over again. And I wanted to portray the emotions that many people, including myself, were feeling. And I wanted to also capture the reflections of what events could have happened um, had the pandemic not happened and the eventual recovery of what moments have been lost. 50 times a day. I guess you could say, I wash my hands 50 times a day. I don't just wash the virus that is ravaging this divided world. I wash anxiety, depression, and the stresses that invade so many minds. I shed away the loneliness that entangles my very life. I rub off the isolation that calluses my skin. I then twist my hands to wash everything once more. The water now ceases, giving me time to reflect on what could have been, what could have occurred, and the growth that has been halted. Life is a jumbled knot ready to be unraveled. There's never a clear sign of how much time zooms, stands silently, or even restarts. I lost my entire sense of it. I guess you could say I wash my hands 50 times a day. I put on a mask and head out the door, walking into the arena for battle against the largest threat of our lives. The water flows open again, thus beginning the slow, aching process of peeling once more. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Hey, thank you to yeah. everyone for sharing yeah. such beautiful pieces. So at this time, we actually have a little more time and we'll be doing a little Q&A. So we're actually going to encourage participation from the audience. Um, if you have any general questions for the speakers that you've just heard or a question for a specific um, speaker, then please raise your hands and we'll call on you.
Chloe Lau, you can unmute yourself. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for sharing your wonderful pieces. Um, this is a general question for everyone. How has your creative process um, in your medium changed from like uh, since being in isolation? Is there anything um, new or perhaps like interesting that you've been doing to keep up your creativity in isolation? Maggie, go ahead. Well, I could say for myself, since I like to take pictures of inner city scenes, I think, I mean, COVID obviously has affected everybody, but it's affected everyone differently. So I was able to capture these really unique scenes that will never happen again. Um, so I think it's, it's made interesting art for me. And then if any of the other uh, speakers want to share, just feel free to mute yourself. Derek? Um, I know for me, oh, um, I know for me, um, since, you know, with isolation, I just um, stay in my own room. And um, um, besides from doing you know, a lot, like my homework and, and other stuff, um, I basically just write whatever comes into my mind since I have a lot more time, alone alone time to do that. So I would say definitely it's a it's an external factor that that forces me to write a lot more <laughs> than I. And I think we have some time for another question. So does anyone else from the audience want to ask a question to our speakers for today? I have a question. Yeah, and I have a question here. for any of the speakers who uh, just read or presented their work. And um, I wonder how you see art as an agent of change because sometimes people will say well great what can a poem do or what can uh, a mural do about the problems that face us and so much of your work directly addressed uh, current societal challenges so i'm wondering how how you see that connection art and uh, real life effects thank you Would one of the speakers who hasn't had a chance to answer the question like to answer? I would like to answer, sorry. Oh, I was having a hard time finding the raise hand button, but um, yeah, so when I was younger, every time that a phrase or a thought came into my head, I would write it down on my phone and I never really made the opportunity for myself to put those words together and make a narrative out of it like I had done until I took an Asian American literature class over the summer with UCI and my professor helped me to realize that literature is an agent of movement and I after taking that class I saw that Asian American discrimination throughout history should be spoken about more in literature and I took that opportunity to write my own narrative on it um, especially because I had read so many books and novels in that class about um, Asian American discrimination, um, especially with a lot of different ethnicities. And so I felt um, it was important for me to write one that dealt with COVID-19. Um, and yeah, that's my experience. With that. All right, I think we have room for one more question from the audience. So would someone like to ask? Alex? Yeah, this is open to all the amazing creators who just presented. Thank you for sharing. But I was wondering how your, how your creative process has informed your thinking on the pandemic and its current outcome. I 
I know we have quite a few people who wrote about the pandemic. So maybe would uh, Derek, Lauren, or Maggie like to share their thoughts about this? Maggie? Yeah, I mean, I was not really aware of uh, San Francisco and its different districts. Um, and when I went to go explore, I got to see how uh, badly affected these people were. Uh, and after I, I went out and took these pictures, it did make me think a lot about how privileged I am to just sit in my uh, nice apartment in a safe neighborhood, uh, get to go to a great university online. These people are out there working, suffering. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was just night and day for me. So if I, if I never did this form of art, then I would have never have got, got to see that. I think that's all the time we have for today for the scribe. So thank you to everyone for sharing your beautiful pieces. And I think we learned a lot from them. And also thank you to the audience for all your support. I think it makes it a very fun and enjoyable event for everyone involved. So at this point in time, I'll actually now be handing the mic over to uh, the Diary of a Med student. Um, so to Daniel Azam and Ajay Sharma, who are the authors of Diary of a Med student. So Daniel and Ajay, uh, please feel free to go ahead and present your works. Thank you so much. Um, is there a way that I can share screen? I believe you're a co-host, so you should be able to share screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, can you see screen here? Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Azam. I am a fourth year medical student at UC Irvine. Um, and I'm the one of the co-founders and co-editors in chief of Diary of a Med Student. I'm really excited to be here and share with you a little bit about our book. Um, this is my other co-founder, AJ Sharma, who's not able to be here today, uh, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through how AJ and I came up with the concept of our book. And then um, if there's time at the end, I do wanna share one of my favorite stories from the book. Um, we're super lucky as well to have Dr. Shapiro here today because she's actually our faculty advisor and also wrote the afterword of our book. Um, so she has a lot of insight as well into the process of why we began this project a couple of years ago. So kind of the background is, as somebody else kind of mentioned about mental health earlier today, um, we've been seeing a lot of rising burnout and mental health issues throughout medical training. And there's many different causes for this. Um, is it a lack of self-awareness during medical training? Is it that we're not efficient as medical students at sharing our stories to a broader audience? Is it that we don't have a strong community connection amongst medical students throughout the nation? Um, or is it a lack of a safe space for inner reflection? Maybe it's a combination of all of these different causes. Um, but one thing we know for sure is that we've been seeing statistics for um, a lot of different issues within mental health. For example, among medical schools, the vast majority don't have a required wellness training, even though we know that this type of therapy can cut suicidal thoughts by up to 50%. Um, for doctors, the suicide rate is twice that of the general population. And this sort of dates all the way back, even before medical school, Pre-meds were actually shown to have um, up to 15% of pre-meds meeting depression criteria. And in general, for everybody else in the audience, um, expression of emotions has been shown to reduce vulnerability overall and suicidal ideation. And so a big part of why we created this project is to promote physician wellness. So I'll give you a little bit of the backstory real quick. So a few years ago, AJ and I were roommates in medical school, and 
we had barely begun our third year clinical rotations, which is where you rotate through the hospital and you sort of see patients for the first time. And we were working really long hours um, and we would come home drained, but then our energy would sort of come back and our excitement would come back as soon as we would start telling each other the stories of what happened to us that day. So that sort of became our ritual. Every evening we'd come home and we'd say, hey, AJ, you're never gonna believe what happened to me today. And then we would just share our stories. A lot of times it was something really happy. Sometimes it was a sad story that we experienced. Um, and other times it was just something that was hilarious. Uh, so we sort of started keeping a personal diary, sort of journaling everything that, all the stories that happened to us during our training. And then we started sharing those stories with our friends in medical school. And what surprised us is that our friends had so many stories to share with us in return as well. And so that's when we started to dream and sort of think. And I thought, huh, wouldn't that be so cool if we could create a safe space for med students all over the whole country to reflect on our emotions and share them as tales in a diary? And the most important goal for us was to promote physician wellness through reflection and expression of emotions. But then COVID came along and during the pandemic, people started to experience a lot of isolation. And so what became really important to us was just showing medical students that we're not alone and that we're all in this together. And so that's sort of how Diary of a Med Student was born. This is the creative process real quick, just walking you through how we turned this idea into an actual physical book. So we started off with creating an editorial board. We put together about 11 editors from schools across the country, both at the medical student and resident physician level. Um, AJ and I served as the editors in chief. And then we basically just opened it up for submissions of stories from all over the country. And we sort of just decided to see what would happen with the project. Um, once we got all the stories, that's when the peer review began. Each story was read by three different editors and then a final acceptance or rejection decision was made. Um, and then after that was when the editing process began and sort of trying to find a publisher and actually publishing the book. Um, fortunately, the, the book was published um, several months ago, actually last year. And it, overall we received 250 stories from um, 61 medical schools across the whole nation. And in the final book, we published 100 stories. This is the distribution. So we got most of the stories were from third years in medical school, because that's when you begin your clerkships, where you rotate through all the, um, the specialties within the hospital. And the first year had a lot of stories as well, because that's sort of those first experience um, stories at the beginning of medical school, where you're brand new and you're in the anatomy lab and all of the experience of becoming a medical student. And then we did get a good number from the second years and then the fourth years upon graduation. Interestingly, I found that a lot of the stories from the older medical students were more focused on broader sort of life balance type of stories, more of the, how can we live a, a good life outside of medicine? How can we have a good relationship with our significant other? and enjoy all of our things that we like to do outside of school. Whereas the younger students were more focused on imposter syndrome and sort of trying to cope with the stresses of studying. Um, we found that the vast majority of, or not the majority, but the most frequent type of story of the four chapters of different emotions was um, Tales of Sorrow. And following that was Tales of Inspiration and then after that, tales of humor, and the least was tales of joy. Now, there's a lot of different ways that this can be interpreted. One is that anecdotally, I found from a lot of the you know, hundreds of students that submitted to us, they would tell me that they find it easiest to write tales of sorrow for whatever reason, whether they were taught how to reflect in that way or they're better at writing things that made them feel sorrow. We're not exactly sure. Um, but I do feel that a lot of the students struggled a little bit with reflecting on tales of joy. And so that could mean that maybe we need better training in teaching medical students how to recognize joy, reflect on 
feelings of joy and and then ultimately write about stories that evoke joy in their readers and and other medical students. Um, these are our supporters. So we had some of you have heard of Sketchy Medical. It's uh, a big medical study resource that helps us for our board exams. And they're actually from UC Irvine School of Medicine a couple of years back before us. They helped us out a lot and they actually wrote the foreword of our book. Um, and they basically, their whole idea is to teach students how to study using cartoon videos. So that first picture that I showed on the home slide, uh, a cartoon of me and AJ holding the book, that was made by Sketchy Medical for us. Online Med Ed um, also helped us out a lot and contributed quotes of praise in our book. And then our preface was written by the Dean of the UCI School of Medicine, Dean Stamos. Dr. Shapiro served as our faculty advisor, helping us out all the way back from the beginning before this was uh, really even barely an idea. Um, and she also helped us out a lot, um, putting together the afterword of our book um, and really just helping our vision grow. Dr. Abraham Vergesi, who's a professor at Stanford, um, an author of Cutting It for Stone, he wrote uh, quotes of praise as well, and his quote is on the front cover. Um, just some of the people that helped us out along the way, and I just wanted to say thanks to them. Um, and now I wanted to share with you one of my favorite stories from the book. So this is um, sort of a lighthearted story that it's called basically a doctor. It's one of my personal favorites and it explores the humorous rituals of a fourth year medical student on the day of traveling to go do their interviews for residency programs. And I like this one because I compare it with my own experience interviewing for residency this year during COVID. So I had to do it all virtually and I was sort of feeling, wow, I'm missing out so much by doing all the interviews virtually. I don't get to see the programs. I don't get a good feel. And then after I read this story, I was like, wow, thank goodness that I had to do my interviews virtually because I, uh, I got to skip out on a lot of the hassle that this medical student had to go through. So I'll just read this story um, for everybody. The fourth and final year of medical school is a bizarre time. From the outsider's perspective, it's the culmination of four whole years. You should basically be a doctor, right? Well, between residency and graduation, interview season hits. In these interview-filled months, I went on 23 interviews, spent 100% of my mom's Southwest points that she collected over the last decade, gained 10% of my body weight at interview dinners, and lost 99% of my knowledge I ever gained in medical school. You get off the plane, you struggle a bit to get your carry-on suitcase out of the overhead bin because fourth year medical students never risk checking their suit. And you do an awkward jog to the nearest airport bathroom. You try to shimmy off the Lululemon leggings that your sister who went to grad school for exactly three years to become a lawyer but makes more money than the rest of the doctors in your family combined bought you while trying, to, <laughs> trying not to let your bare feet touch the nasty airport bathroom floor. You shake the wrinkles out of the familiar outfit that you wear to basically every pre-interview social and you give it a sniff to make sure it smells okay, even though there's no alternative if it stinks. You spray some dry shampoo and switch out your Adidas for Steve, some Steve Madden, stuff your stuff back into your bulging bag that contains supplies supposed to last at least six interviews. You jog to the passenger pickup area of the airport and see if Lyft or Uber is cheaper right now, usually Lyft. You get in it. Are you just visiting for fun? Oh, I'm actually in town for a job interview. Cool, what job? I'm in medical school and I'm applying for residency. That's great, what kind of nurse will you be? You bring your carry-on into the restaurant where the social is and you spend the next two to three hours chatting with other fourth year medical students who also probably haven't been home in weeks. You get back to your hotel around nine or 10 p.m struggle to fall asleep because you're scared you'll sleep through your alarm and wake up just hours later, ready to take on interview day. Repeat, welcome to MS4, you're basically a doctor. So that was one of, one of the stories I really liked. Um, and I've shared that with so many 
so so many of my classmates who interviewed virtually this year and they all had a similar re reaction to me and just I feel like it's a really unifying experience um, just something that everybody has to go through in medical school um, and it's it's sort of comforting to see that we all go through the same thing um, lastly just a few take-home messages from our project um, for all of all of you in the audience. Um, the testimonials that we got from the authors who contributed stories in our book um, showed us that sharing emotions is therapeutic. And also reading other stories, whether you wrote one or not yourself, is something that's very unifying and therapeutic as well. Some of the common themes that we saw for medical students in today's training, mostly for the first and second years, they experience a lot of what we call imposter syndrome. That's sort of the feeling that I don't fit in, I don't belong here, um, which is really interesting because if, if every student feels like everyone's better than me, I'm an imposter, I don't belong here, then that, that, that doesn't really make sense. So it's not until we all read those stories about other classmates going through the same thing that we realize that, hey, we're all, if we, we're not all imposters, we all belong here. Um, we saw a lot of stories about inequality, um, dealing with sociopolitical issues such as race, um, and then things having to do with the elections and things like that. There was a lot of stories about the challenges of COVID-19, dealing with seeing patients with you're wearing a mask or seeing them over a virtual uh, history and physical. Um, a lot of stories about isolation as well. And then just, you know, the typical things about being a student, the stress of exams, always being evaluated by your, um, your attending physicians who are grading you. And then some of the older medical students reflecting on work-life balance a little bit more. Some suggestions we have for medical education in the future is to have a dedicated wellness training within the curriculum. And we hope that physician wellness will one day be considered one of the core qualities of a physician. Um, reflection sessions are something that's really important as well. We had one at our medical school called an open mic where we basically passed around a microphone and we got to share our own stories in front of our classmates. Um, a, a space for sharing stories, a safe space is really important. At UCI, we're lucky because we have Plexus and that's an annual publication where students can reflect and express themselves through art and other, other types of styles. And we think that every school should have something like Plexus. Um, and we're trying to uh, promote that idea and sort of get them involved and encourage that through Diary of a Med Student as well. And then lastly, just sort of resilience days where students can take care of anything that's important in their life. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that our book is available for anybody who's interested on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Our website is here, diaryofamedstudent.com. And what we're most proud of about our whole project is that 100% of our proceeds are donated to our scholarship fund for incoming and current medical students. So we've actually been able to sell already about 1,300 copies of the book. And all of that is going towards the scholarship fund. And so we're, we're hoping to launch that within the next year or so and open it up to keep the, the mission alive for the future years to come. Thank you so much to uh, the Plexus and the Scribe for having us today. Thank you again to Dr. Shapiro and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much to Daniel for sharing your story and about Diary of a Med Student. Just to let everyone know, um, um, don't forget to fill out the Google form because we are giving out up to five copies of Diary of a Med Student. So if you want to read it too, then make sure to fill out the Google form and you'll be entered into the raffle. And all you have to do is just attend this event and fill out the form. That's it. All right, so at this point in time, we'll be featuring our next guest speaker, uh, Dr. Alma Ray. So Dr. Alma Ray is an associate professor of dance in the university, at the University of California, Irvine. And as the founder of Embodyology, Dr. Ray's creative work has always been inspired by improvisation. 
It is at the heart of Jazz Exchange and at the foundation of all her multidisciplinary collaborations with composers, dancers, playwrights, technologists, filmmakers, educators, and scientists. And along her artistic works on the stage, Dr. Ray has pioneered teaching methods that are guided in deep learning, community building, and self-realization. And the global pandemic, while raising fear and anxiety in many, was a catalyst for Dr. Ray to build community with vigor and heart. So today, Dr. Ray will be leaving a brief mindfulness activity for our attendees and also share her thoughts on incorporating mindfulness practices in the context of resilience. Uh, Dr. Ray, um, whenever you are ready, then please feel free to uh, present your work. Hello and good evening to everyone. I am very happy to be with you today. And in fact, I was just working on a new iteration of the work that began during this pandemic space. I was in Florida at the time when the pandemic hit. I was on a sabbatical actually. And I was isolated because I wasn't with family. I was between conferences and traveling out of the country. And I was actually on a residency in a in a setting for artists that are involved in in sort of deep dive in terms of their inquiry so i was in a very remote place and in the midst in the midst of all this i felt this kind of anxiety growing around me internationally um locally although i wasn't actually in in, in council then with anyone locally I, I felt this um, need to do something that wasn't the panic. Um, and I sort of settled on the idea, I'm not going to go out and buy lots of toilet paper. I am not going to do that. I am going to sit and I'm going to figure out a way to do what I do virtually. And this is, I didn't know what was happening at UCI at the time but I decided that I needed to do something and connect. And so by choice, I chose to teach on Zoom. I didn't have to, I chose to. So I'd like to, if possible, share my screen um, because I'd like to show a little video and I'm just pulling it up right now um which introduces this practice that i gave rise to in this virtual space and then i'll talk a little bit more about it so let me share so i started it in florida at the atlantic center for the arts And I'm going to press play and go to full screen. Getting out of your head and being able to use your own space. I'm writing now and now I feel awakened to continue writing and just continue being creative and letting my thoughts flow in a productive manner. And even when I'm not on this call, I can exercise what we just did. It was nice to be in a free space again. I've forgotten the, 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 the you know, the, the nice vibes that you get from just being able to move it, at your own pace, in your own way. However, it was, it was quite liberating. As it went on, I realized that what I was trying to do was undo anxiety. There was just a lot of anxiety and I was in touch with it and you know, soothing and opening and grounding. That was the beginning of my online teaching. And then I came back to UCI in April for the spring and then got back into the world of teaching at UCI where I don't teach in bodyology as a practice, as, as a regular part of the curriculum. But what that already did, it set me up for a type of mindful engagement with my students that felt purposeful, 
So I was already, I'd already made a, a shift in what I was doing in this space. And what was really interesting during that next span of two, three months, we experienced this colossal wave of rage because of what was happening on the streets and the violence against black peoples in the United States. We also saw the rise of police violence in Nigeria. So we we're seeing a lot of tensions around the world and, and there are more. And so this space became its own healing space. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing, but I knew that I needed to do something that was not going in this place. And that's the breath, right? Shortening and tightening and closing in. And I'm a dancer, right? We're used to taking up space, moving in three dimensions, and we're all suddenly constrained to two foot by two foot. But even within that, there's agency, right? There's purpose in being able to reimagine the spaces that, that we are in. And so I've taken that to heart in the sense that it's been a place of inquiry for me. So I started teaching three days a week. I was teaching on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Saturday because it just felt like we needed that. We needed to come together. You know, I was estranged from my family, um, just feeling cut off and not knowing. So it, I needed it as much as others that were coming. And then there were these amplified moments along the way. And, and one of the things I was sure about in terms of what I was seeking to create was courage, it was courage to stay inside of this place of unknowing through the practice of improvisation without raising our, our um, sense of impending uh, fear, right? For me, it was all about getting ready for going back out into the world, right? So getting back, get, even as long as it would take to actually still have a full sense of one's own agency and how are we going to do that in two foot square? Well, we're going to explore that two foot square in a range of different ways. And so I developed these movement puzzles which bring body and mind together that really uh, have you engage in a very intentional way of moving and central to all of that is the breath and so we do a lot of um, mindful work in terms of body scanning and connection so I'm just going to give you a little example of that if, you, if you'd like to participate just for a minute or two so I'm imagining that you're seated and uh, you can close your eyes if you'd like because uh, we don't really need to see the screen unless you need to see my lips moving and I want you to place a hand on your abdominal area and just feel your breath expanding from as low down in this pelvic area as you possibly can. And then I'd like you to Consider releasing your jaw. You are at ease. Release the brow. Soften. I'd like you just to bring a little awareness to the surfaces of your body that meets a support, be it the chair, be it the floor. And as you find that connection, that support, 
allow that relaxation, that softening to be supported by that cycle of your breath, which is now likely slowing down and more generous. Now we're going to activate some activity in your joints. So we're going to start with the shoulders. We're going to bring your shoulder blades together. So if you, as if you wanted to create a river between your shoulder blades. So we're creating a the pathway and then release those shoulders, release them, breathe out. Let that relaxation go into the floor. Softening. Relax the jaw. Release the tongue. And you're probably seeing the dance of your light whilst your eyes are closed. And again, even explore the possibility of not following that light, but rather following your breath. And now we're going to engage your toes. I'm going to spread your toes as if you're spanning them to make space between each of your toes. And do the same with your fingers, spreading the span of your hands. Breathe in, breathe out and relax the hands, the shoulders, the feet, the chin. And just slowly bring your awareness back to the space. See what is directly in front of you and make a cognitive connection by naming it. So I'm looking at a bookcase. So as I'm looking, I name it. And then I'm going to turn my gaze and I'm going to look somewhere else and I'm going to name what I see. And then change your gaze again, name it in your mind and then change it again and then come back to neutral. Okay, we're going to do all those four points again. You named it, you know where you went. Let's go on that journey again. So this is a little movement puzzle. So you've got point one, you've got point two, you've got point three, you've got point four, you've got one, you've got two, you've got three, you've got four, you've got one, really see it, name it two, name it three, name it four. Now, instead of your eyes, you're going to replace your eyes with your hand. Here we go. Extending in the direction of where you were looking, name it, and then the other direction, two, and three, and four. Again, one, and two, and three, and four. Again, one, look at it, see, are you making that cognitive connection and are you breathing? And four. Okay, now we're going to reverse. Four, three, two, one. Use the other hand. Four, three, two, 
one. Okay, so one arm's going to do, go in the forwards direction and the other arm is going to reverse. Let's go. And one. Yes, Joanna. Two and three and four. And again, one and two. Breathe now. Three. That's it, Rhonda. There you go. Joy in motion. You have made it. Well done. Okay, so these are the kinds of cognitive puzzles that we work on. Sometimes they're rhythmically based, sometimes they're uh, dynamically um, based on other concepts. So it could be language, it could be shape, it could be a piece of um, clothing. So we have a whole space, which is a, what I um, call social skin. So we actually wear a particular color to the space. Yes, and remembering to breathe is a major part of this work because that is where your agency comes back right because when we're not breathing we're like oh panic i'm in that panic space and that's normal it's normal because you're putting you're putting a cognitive load and you're doing something that you're not used to doing covid has been all about that right we've been in one giant improvisation so embodyology intentionally puts you into the space of improvisation. Um, so I'm going to show you one last thing. Whilst we were in this COVID moment, there was an amazing opportunity that came about because of the relationship that this work has to uh, a community in West Africa, in Ghana which is where the research continues to be centered as I bring this work forwards. And many people were doing dance classes online and, 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 and I continued and I'm still taking this class continues into uh, up until now. And in fact, I did a series for the Samueli Center for about six weeks in February. But I decided to create a fundraiser. I have a nonprofit, and we said, let's create a fundraiser to support the village in Ghana to be able to engineer their first computer lab. And so that happened, and it opened last week, last month. Then. So donations were made by class members over a year. And this, compute, this community is a rich community in terms of its cultural capital. This is where I learn. And this is what I translate into what you've just done. So they are purveyors of performance and ritual and airway knowledge, indigenous knowledge. And so now the children at the school have their first computer lab. And so it's super exciting that what began as anxiety, not knowing what to do, has turned into this international community building space that will continue. So in spite of COVID, with COVID, without COVID, my online classes will continue because it has built community, a different community than I was teaching before. Before I was mostly concerned with artists and now the world has diametrically changed in terms of who this work is reaching. Yes. <laughs> so yes, yeah, a pretty charmed story, but it's real. I mean, we did it. It's um, and and there's benefit all of, all around. So if anybody would like to come to take an, um, a class on a Saturday, you are welcome. I'll put a link into the chat if there is one. Um, and we start with meditative breathing, just as we did, but it's much longer than that. The class is an hour. It's 10 a.m. To 11 a.m., and it is still 
um, donation based, but only for another couple of weeks. It is going to become a subscription class, but there's still going to be a way for people to donate to enable low waged or students to be able to participate. So I'm constantly mining for opportunity to enable the community to be dynamic. As you saw, it was rich culturally, and that's the way I want to see it prosper and continue to reciprocally benefit the peoples through whose technology, their performance technology, their spiritual technology, their ways of knowing the world through the body have given this agency. So thank you for allowing me to share. Hope this fits well into your billing. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Amare, for leading through us uh, the mindfulness exercise as well as sharing how you've incorporated um, your work into the idea of community resilience. Um, I hope everyone else also had a fun time going through that exercise. I It was really nice for me to, to also get some peace and uh, calmness in during such a time that's so busy and there's just so much going on. So at this point in time, I'm actually going to be introducing um, Ashley Hope and Kenneth Schmidt, who will be leading the Plexus portion of the event. So Ashley and Kenneth, you have the floor. Hi, thank you so much, Niran, for having us at this conference. And thank you, Dr. Ray, for that uh, wonderful exercise in mindfulness. It was really eye-opening. Um, so hi everyone and thank you so much for coming. We are really excited today to launch the 2021 issue of Plexus. Um, as you said, I'm Ashley, I'm an MS3 and I'm one of the co-editors in chief of Plexus this year along with Kenny, who's also an MS3. Um, Plexus is a medical student organized publication that showcases creative work by medical students, physicians, faculty and others in the UCI medical community. Um, and our hope is that Plexus will always be a creative and welcoming space in which we can all reflect and share our experiences in medicine and in life. And this year, more than ever, we hope that this remains true. Uh, Plexus was started at UCI 22 years ago. Um, and for this year's edition, our theme is emergence. And in this issue, we want to highlight the past year as a time of new things coming into being, whether good or bad, and to hold hope for the possibility of change for the better. Emergence is a process of coming to view and bringing things to light, as well as the philosophy that greater things may arise, which are unexpected and far better than any of the parts we see. Before we get started with our lineup of amazing presenters, we want to recognize some people who have made really important contributions. So this is the first year that Plexus has had a team of MS1 associate editors, and we're so lucky to have them. Uh, we have Aaron, Selena, Kathleen, Kelsey, and Rhea. Uh, and we would also like to give special thanks to our faculty advisors, Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Wen, um, whose continuous support and guidance have made this work possible. Thank you, Ashley, for introducing Plexus. Um, and thank you for everyone who's contributed and um, we're glad to be here. So we do have six medical students who will be presenting selected pieces for this year's issue. Uh, where they're going to have to, they're going to introduce themselves and their pieces. And afterwards, we will be announcing uh, the winners of the medical student competition. So first off, we have Alex Richardson, who will be per performing Emergence. All right, hello, uh, thank you. Um, so I've never actually really performed one of these. So I'm just gonna try to, figure this out on the fly, but I want to just talk a little bit about this piece or just generally, I guess, um, uh, yeah, a little bit about uh, music and things. So I ended up actually making the beat for it with one of my roommates, Vince, uh, Vince Hussey. He's also, uh, he's, I guess, technically almost at MS4 now. So, and then, um, then I saw, I was just gonna submit the beat, but then I kind of want to do something in terms of like, I don't really write lyrics much. So I kind of want to try to figure out, like get a little practice and write something real quick for, uh, uh, to see what I could do and then put it all together in like a uh, little, uh, basically production and then just basically do some practice. So I am not fully sure how to do get the in terms of audio doing live and everything so I was mainly going to play the piece for you guys and then I'll have the kind of um, 
I'll just share the lyrics and stuff. And then I guess I'll be, I'll just try to like wrap over it in terms of video wise. So you have a little bit of something to watch, I guess. But all right, let me figure out, let me see. In terms of audio, um, share, I'm sorry. Let's see, share screen. So if I share screen, I think I should share and sound. Here we go. All right. Um, oh, let's see. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, um, can you hear the audio coming out? Can you hear anything here? No, I don't think we're hearing anything at the moment. Right. When you want to share sound, when you're sharing your screen, you need to check the box in the bottom left corner that says share sound. I did. It told me something about installing something. And so I'm trying to do that. So uh yeah it's not currently letting me it says it should be sharing sound can you hear anything now no i don't hear anything all right um let me see i guess i'll just actually if i don't share this i can just play the thing through the speakers and this is a little little ghetto unfortunately but let's see if i can get this working all right i'm sorry about all the technical difficulties but yeah it's not playing right now shoot alex if you want you and i can hop off and do like a quick sound check and let others present i want to make sure that your piece is presented the way that you want it to be presented yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay, all right. Sorry, about we'll be that. back later. All no right. worries. Sounds good. Uh, we'll let you uh, kind of do what you need to do, and then uh, the next person coming up is Melinda Lem, and she will be presenting uh, a written piece called "A Caution." Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Melinda. I'm finishing up third year. There's two weeks to go, so fourth year is around the corner. So um, I a little bit about me. I was born and raised in San Francisco, in the city, and not outside in the city. So I have a very unique experience um, just seeing all the changes uh, throughout the city throughout the years. Um, and then I went to Cornell for undergrad, came back to California. Um, and took a few years off before medical school working in a stage four cancer clinic. Um, so that paired with my uh, experience of being a daughter of a minister has been very influential in how um, I see the world, how I see medicine and what humanity means to me. Um, so a lot of the work I have is basically just reflections of how um, or, or how terrifying the creeping feeling of burning out is when you're going through clinical training. Um, and, and hopefully that is portrayed through this piece. Um, so I think it's gonna be shared, uh, the, the screen is gonna be shared on someone else's computer. I think it was supposed to be Ashley's. Hi, sorry, I am gonna run off to okay. help Alex. So you can share your own screen, that setting okay. was okay. I will share my own screen. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Okay. So um, this piece is called A Caution. Um, so what used to be the careful listening of childhood trauma became the rush for alcohol withdrawal symptoms and the most recent CWAS score. What used to be 
asking about grandchildren and hobbies became asking about 24 hours eyes and O's, pain and getting out of bed. What used to be an hour of time with a patient became 30 minutes, then 15, then the desire for it to take five. What used to be an empathetic or empathic presence became an automatic set of questions in a preset worksheet format. What used to take three hours on a detailed life story became a discharge note and a stranger hours later. What used to be fresh excitement and novelty became a standard routine and a hope to leaving early. What used to be the best part of medicine became the part I at times dreaded. What used to be humanity became the slow bleeding thereof. What used to be that won't happen to me became a caution. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. That was a beautiful piece. Thank you for sharing that with us. Next, we have Paula Mendoza. And this will be the piece, Sarcoma. Hello, I'm Paula. I'm, a, oh, well, my dog decided to just pop up in the screen. <laughs> um, I'm an MS3. I was born and raised in Inglewood, California. I'm a daughter of an immigrant, single parent household, and um, kind of just my upbringing and the things that I've personally have gone through in my experiences really actually helped me connect with a lot of patients during this third year. And so this piece is called Sarcoma. And let me see if I can. And I wrote some of these pe two pieces um, that I sent to the um, plexus during my pediatrics rotation, actually. Um, some of the things that I saw and some things that happened were kind of really dark sometimes. And um, in peds, I feel like kids bring so much joy and light, um, but a lot of things happen. <laughs> so let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay. Oh, someone did it for me. Great. I think, yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, sarcoma. And then uh, also the, the way I wrote this is, this is kind of a medical student going in to see a patient. So, good morning. Let's look at your neck. Here we are, probing at it again. It's not EBV or CMV. One, two, three, cat. I know what this could be, Bardinella. Negative, unfortunately. We try antibiotics. You're looking all right. How's school? It's all online? That's the part about COVID you really seem to like. Because even at the hospital, you can't fall behind. You do your homework, you play your games, you smile all of the time, anyone says your name. I wish it wasn't true that this could have been infectious. You're only 12, your name starts with an S, but I wish your diagnosis didn't, sarcoma. And so this is like a real thing that happened and it was kind of unfortunate um, for the patient, but, um, it was, it really brought us together, I think. That's it. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for sharing uh, your experience. Um, and the next uh, presenter is Alex Wang. And they will be presenting the piece, Fight or Flight. Hey everyone, my name's Alex. I'm a fourth year medical student, currently taking a year off to pursue an MBA. Um, so later on next year, I'll be applying into psychiatry. And just a little more about the background behind this piece. Um, the title is Fight or Flight. So during my third year rotations, right around March, we were all taken off rotations because of COVID. And then in May, my first rotation back was actually ob -GYN. And so this was my first week back on ob -GYN, just coming off of COVID when patients are not allowed to be in the, or like patient families are not allowed to be in the hospital. And it's just only the patient themselves. Um, so that's the background for this story. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, perfect. 
It's 3 a.m. I'm slowly drifting to sleep before suddenly my phone begins to beep. My resident calls me over to sit as her neighbor and assist with the Nulli Paris mother in stage two of labor. I count out loud during each contraction and encourage the patient to push with decisive action. The delivery period is expected to be lengthy, so my resident leaves to ensure the other patients are safe and healthy. 15, 30, 45 minutes tick on down. Soon the baby's head begins to crown. The nurse urgently pages for the physician, all the while the baby's head moves forward in position. Only a medical student and one nurse in sight, the adrenaline kicks in, fight or flight. I quickly gown up and place my gloves on as the patient continues to scream, come on. Countless days of studying, hours of practicing delivering, training turns into reality, time to deliver the baby free. With a final push and surge, the crying baby has swiftly emerged. Seconds later, the team arrives, celebrating the delivery of new life. And so pretty much um, that was the story where I was on my ob labor and delivery rotation. It was an overnight call. And I was the only one in the room along with the nurse who happened to be a brand new nurse. I think this was her first week, um, just working solo as well. And so neither of us had very much experience um, with deliveries. And in that moment, I just decided, I just, I don't know, fight or flight kicked in. And then I decided to just put my gloves on and I delivered the baby by myself. All right, thank you, Alex, for sharing that experience. That's a very unique experience, thank you. Up next, we have Brian Hanst, who will be presenting the piece, Library Card. Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you, Brian. Thank you, okay, so uh, I'm Brian, I am, an MS2 heading on to MS3. Let me just make sure, I think this is it. I think that's it, right? Yeah. So yeah, so I, I wrote this while, um, you know, thinking about my mom. Oh yeah, this is a new computer. I kind of like have trouble seeing stuff when I like do this. So let's see, hopefully this, hopefully this works. Sorry, I'm gonna, I have to stop the share. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I can't see anything when, when I do that. I have to, this is a new computer. I have to work the kink out, but let me see if I can. Um, oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. So let me, let me go ahead. Um, this is called library card. Bleeding time is much less graphic than real bleeding, but it still instills fright. I wonder sometimes how much time there truly is. Who notices that it's gone when we steal it? I wonder how much of my mother's time I stole from her when I was getting on her nerves. The counterpoint, of course, is that her time was and is a gift. Love is a gift, like time. Neither are technically scarce, but sometimes the rations don't sit as nicely as they should. What is missing on any given day is not always quenched by a phone call. Cooped up in a box with the kitchen, still feels like being cooped up after all. I wish I could open the hatch a bit, but can't right now. In the pit of my guts, the stones of misused time sit, mocking me because they can still obstruct my peace of mind. I wish this was not the case, but regardless, I keep going to sleep and waking up. So my library card hasn't been scratched off the list yet. If it's going to keep getting renewed, might as well keep reading. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for sharing that with us. And next we have Ria Bansal presenting the written piece, Educated. Hi everyone, my name is Ria and I'm a current MS1 going on to MS2 soon. Um, I'm from the Bay Area and I went to UC Davis for undergrad. Uh, my poem, Educated, is about maintaining a positive view of medicine and preventing burnout. Um, and I'll kind of dive deeper into what motivated me to write this poem after reading it. Um, so I was wondering actually if someone could share their screen. Thank you so much. Okay, so this poem is called Educated and it is inspired by the book Educated by Tara Westover. 
It's such a blessing to be educated and view the world not as a checkerboard, but as the vast seas with its accelerating depths, blue-green waves within, softer hues of gray. Ceasing the sail, I flow with the currents, allow for changing directions, surrendering to the new horizons. For if I choose the easy shores, I will never meet the curious creatures who can unlock all of the doors. So I actually wrote this poem towards the end of 2020 um, upon finishing our first official quarter of medical school. Um, and I kind of wrote this poem in response to some of the challenges that I personally faced during my transition into medical school. Um, there was kind of a lot going on at that time be between dealing with the chaos of COVID-19 and the very sudden transition from like my personal blissful eight to four work life to all of a sudden having um, all of my classes on Zoom and setting long study hours into the night. Uh, I realized burnout reached me a lot quicker than I expected. And when I talked to a lot of my other classmates, I realized that many of these challenges were commonly faced by other students of my class as we began embarking on our medical school journey. Um, and I found myself quickly getting wrapped up in this mentality that I was learning to pass my classes. And I didn't find that uh, super intrinsically motivating. I wanted to study um, to help people in the future. Um, so I knew I had to change that mentality somehow. And I began reflecting on this. And uh, during this time, I was actually also reading the book Educated by Tara Westover, which I highly recommend to anyone who hasn't read it. Um, it is a really fascinating read and I learned so much from it. And uh, one of the most important things I learned was how much I was taking my ability to pursue higher education for granted as Tara had to overcome so many family and financial hurdles just to pursue a simple high school or college education. So I decided um, after that, after reading that, and after reflecting further to kind of switch my mentality from a more negative view to a more positive view and uh, started to feel really grateful for having the opportunity to pursue my dream career of helping others and letting go of the perception of learning as a form of stress rather than learning to fuel my curiosity and give back to society. So thank you so much um, for listening and all of these poems have been so great. So thank you all for sharing as well. Thank you, Ria. Beautiful perspective. Thank you for sharing that with us. We wanted to now um, come back to Alex. It seems like um, we have a solution in terms of the sound and he will be performing his piece called Emergence. Uh, hi again. Um, so I think we should have a solution going for us, but yeah, just a quick bit about uh, the piece, I guess, it is basically, um, it was fairly spontaneous and then it's a little darker take on emergence but I guess it was kind of I think I was in psychiatry at the time and I was thinking of some of the difficulties some of the people with uh such as schizophrenia or also uh, difficulties with uh, having gone to prison or had different experiences that kind of in a sense stain you and how it can make it difficult for some people to really in a way emerge so it was kind of like a, a different a little, yeah, definitely a negative take, but a kind of approaching the obstacles to a personal emergence and things along those lines. And it's kind of like a narrative, not about anyone specifically, but it's kind of like a third person narrative I came up with about that. So without further ado, let's do the screen sharing. All right, and can you see? And then I'm gonna do just quick, let's see. We go yeah we can see it perfect and then this is just like basically the quick uh little mix down of what was happening but here we go Bagging his feet, is it even halfway through the week? Just falling asleep, needing to eat, barely even able to speak. All under the dreams, on the concrete, disabling things. Not really getting the notion, he could barely understand the puddle, let alone the ocean. Down in his open, avalanche motion, rubble under the collapse, settling into the relapse. You felt the oncoming. 
kick and jack. Psycho like beat beats back to sleep. Got needles like DJs, always on replay. Sleeping under the freeways. Actions you wish she could replace. Past days of running relays, but all they do is relay in the mind. On the wine all the time before the crimes. In a better day, wondering how to just press for play. Got a hop with some fresh crop, but no, this is not easy. A simple plan to execute a seeming needle, cause what's the use? Eyes the hunger proof to give him an excuse to continue you climbing the escher with all of the effort of the under the pressure. He finds his head hurt for one day more. Come on, get it together. Drinks for P, but the TV says it's so easy. Why can't he be? He wonders. Just change who you are, they say, but he always blunders. Change the person, update the version. It's simple. Emergence. I hope you guys can hear that, but uh, yeah, that was basically, that was a little rundown of it, but uh, thank you. I was never performed anything, so first for me, <laughs> and then let me use pause sharing or stop. All right. All right. Thank you, Alex. That was, that was great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So um something we wanted to share right now is every year plexus holds a competition uh for notable pieces submitted by medical students and we will now be announcing this year's winners and those who win you will be receiving an email from us uh, later next week to claim your prize so without further ado um in the visual category uh the winning pieces are breaking wave by tammy tran and bloom plume bloom by Don Liang. For the written category, uh, the winning pieces are Dragonfly in Amber by Bethlehem Tesfe and A Little Soda for Thought by Anna Cardall. And for the performing category, the winning pieces are Emergence by Alex Richardson and On My Way Remix by Harrison Lam. Thank you guys for uh, submitting and um, thank you for all the creative works that were expressed today um, in this uh, conference slash Zoom call. All right, thank you so much everyone for coming and for everyone who contributed to this year's edition of Plexus um, and congratulations again to the winners. Um, we just published this year's edition to the website, which I am going to put in the chat. Um, so if you want to go browse our issue, it's available online. Um, and at the end of the symposium, um, as you and said, there will be a virtual gallery showcasing the work from this year's journal and we highly suggest browsing it. Um, we hope that you enjoy this year's journal and that you'll submit for next year's journal as well. Um, and that concludes the Plexus portion of this virtual symposium. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And for our final guest speaker of tonight, it will be Dr. Huck. So Dr. Huck is a clinical professor and chair of family medicine. And for this last portion of the event, she'll be speaking about resilience and emergence in health and medicine. So Dr. Huck, take it away. Thank you so much. and. Uh... Let me first start out with a big congratulations to the organizers, everyone who submitted and planned for this extraordinary event. It was just simply remarkable. And talk about resilience. I'm feeling like a few inches taller at least because of your creativity, uh, your careful listening and observational skills, your application of those observations to healing yourselves, your community, and your patients. So thank you so much for that just wonderful lineup of creative efforts. Uh, many of these just blew me away, to be honest. So I'll be thinking about them and absorbing the messages for many, many days to come. Um, I, I just want to recognize the courage it takes to not only create something new and special on your own, 
but also then to share it with the public audience. And uh, again, thank you because you've inspired and encouraged all the rest of us. So starting with that. Um, I was asked to say a few words about um, resilience and emergence. And I, I, what I'm gonna do is just take a very short time to share my screen and go through a few slides. But then I'd just like to share some of my observations more about what I heard tonight from all of you. So let's see if this will work. I'll share my screen. Can you see that okay? You're seeing my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna just uh, talk a little bit about the importance of honoring our stories. And the fact that each and every one of us is on our own particular journey, trying to figure out how to keep fed and stay out of the waves too much and uh, keep on going, uh, despite what's been a really challenging year and really challenging uh, missions for all of us. I'm gonna talk just a bit about burnout. I almost was gonna leave out this, but I thought, well, there's medical students here who've been talking about it. So I wanna share some thoughts about burnout and how humanities and the arts can serve as an antidote as we've all maybe perhaps felt tonight. We're gonna to talk just a bit about resilience and then the steps you can take to really uh, build your own resi resilience capacity. So I think we've all seen the definition of burnout, your energy's low, you don't feel like you're treating people, other people as human beings, you're just trying to get through the job, but you don't feel very good about yourself either. And um, you really are not actually performing very well either oftentimes uh, at work. Okay, this is burnout at work. When you go home, you feel pretty good, but at work, uh, you just don't have the pizzazz, that energy that you had before. It's very common, unfortunately, um, for those of us, for many of us in the healing and serving professions, it's easy to feel run down and run out of energy. And you see here, um, these are some studies that have been done in the last decade or so. Uh, you see the, the prevalence, the common feelings of burnout among physicians in particular, but I would say this is not just particular to physicians, nurses, psychologists, um, any healing profession, or even a lot of our public service officers can feel this way. Why, why, why does this happen? Well, we're working pretty hard, especially during a pandemic. And we're working so hard, we can't even go to the bathroom or eat properly or sleep enough. And, and then we don't have the support system that we need around us to help us get through a tough period. Uh, sometimes we just, it, we become so tunnel vision that we don't even understand what's going on. And oftentimes we feel like certain things need to be done, but we can't do the right thing because of our position or the resource limitations. And oftentimes we get uh, an imbalance in overworking, workaholism, and the conditions for burnout uh, are, are most prevalent when there's a high level of responsibility, but a low level of control. So you can't really call the shots, but boy, you are responsible for a lot of the outcomes that as we heard with that baby that got born, and luckily the student was able to catch that baby at the right moment. So um, unfortunately, there's some, fortunately there's great strengths that physicians bring of being very thorough and committed and sometimes perfectionistic and caring and altruistic, but those same strengths can have a shadow side. And that shadow side creates these vulnerabilities that we have to becoming over compulsive and committed and workaholic and needing certainty and, and sometimes then even depersonalizing uh, our own patients uh, because the input is so much. And at the same time, oftentimes feeling not so good about yourself, right? But on the other hand, what's resilience? It's that ability to bounce back despite the stress. Uh, regaining equilibrium after a difficult something happened, right? And how is it that we build that resilience? Well, there are things we can do as an individual 
There are things we can do as a community. And there are things that our institutions can do to support our resilience and to help us uh, avoid uh, certain burnout, right? There's so many things that we can do. And, you know, starting with just the simple acts of taking good care of ourselves, right? Uh, now, doctors are not supposed to be their own doctors. In fact, it can be dangerous. So you have to be really careful. But at the same time, we know that a lot of health doesn't come from doctoring, it comes from the way we live, work and play, right? And so what if you were your own patient? What would you be recommending to take care of yourself? And you wanna make sure that you're doing that as well as you can. You want to reach out for support. And this is exactly what's happened tonight is that everyone who has shared their emotions, their vulnerability has created connections and feeling that we're in this together, that we're part of a community all dedicated towards the health of our patients, but also caring for one another. So um, I, he I heard a bit earlier about the importance of recognizing joy and celebrating joy and the ability to find joy in just these very small moments and observations, uh, listening carefully to a patient, having a sense as if you've helped to alleviate their suffering, even if you might not have been able to cure their disease. Sustaining healthy relationships with, with your peers, your friends, your family, and that takes time and ensuring that you've set enough time to cultivate and maintain those important relationships. Finally, like being somewhat philosophical as we've heard tonight by all of the, the wonderful writing and even the dancing and performance of music, uh, the, the philosophical approach of looking at the big picture, stepping back, not taking ourselves too seriously, but realizing that we're part of a very big complex fabric. And also we can cultivate our own self-reflection and self-awareness. And I just couldn't resist sharing what part of what keeps me going, my family, my beautiful uh, four children and now five grandchildren, the, the fifth is missing from this photo, but uh, I'm so proud and uh, happy to have a family nearby that can help support me through tough times. Um, I'm gonna stop my sharing. Uh, just so I can say just a couple of other words. I, I, I'm so happy that you, you chose the themes of resilience and emergence that has come out of this terrible period that we've gone through together. What we often call a syndemic, a combination of a biological pandemic, but also so many social effects of the economic collapse, the isolation, the mental health disorders. But what you've demonstrated here tonight is that out of difficult periods, beauty and inspiration can arise. I love the, the image of the lotus rise, rising out of the skeleton and the diaries of a med student. What a creative piece of work. It's so, uh, so meaningful and helpful to students, I'm sure, uh, and many others across the whole country. You know, I heard we're not, we're not in this alone, we're in this together. And basically we can and, and should support one another through this time. I love the intimacy and the sharing of the vulnerability of the anxiety, the fear, but also the determination to rise back up again. The fight or flight and the birth of a newborn, uh, the emergence really of a new time when uh, we have students and young people like you who are able to speak the truth and to see the flaws in our system, to see the many challenges that lie ahead for you and your careers and really facing healthcare in the United States and beyond. We have so many challenges ahead, but tonight has given me inspiration and hope that our future is in good hands of the next generation with the creative work uh, of students like you. So thank you so much for letting me uh, join you tonight and for commenting. Uh, 
All right, thank you, Dr. Hodge. <laughs> so that's it, that concludes our event. Um, we want to thank all the guest speakers and authors for making this night come alive. I feel, I feel very at peace right now. I, I really mm -hmm. loved all the work that were presented and I don't know, I just feel very relaxed and I feel um, motivated and very strong and you know, pertains to theme uh, resilience and emergence. So um, thank you to everyone. And as a final thing of our event, Yuen will now be dropping a link in the chat to our um, virtual gallery. But um, before that, uh, Yuen has some words to say. Yes, so thank you again to everyone. It was great hearing such diverse, diverse works from all of our students from our undergrads to medical students to our faculty. And I think it's brought a greater, greater sense of community, especially in time where we really need it. Um, so at this time, um, so normally this narrative medicine symposium would have been held in person, but unfortunately it wasn't able to be held in person. So instead we put together a virtual exhibition so if you click on the link, you can walk through a 3D gallery as if you were there in person. So um, even though, you know, the conditions weren't ideal, we would have loved to see all of you in person. We hope that this um, is a way for us to highlight all of the wonderful works that we've received through the through both Plexus and the Scry. So at this time, I'm actually going to hand over um, the attention to Joseph, who will be announcing the winners of our raffle. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank you all and just speaking for, for tonight's event. Um, I am a bit nervous, sorry. <laughs> this is my first time ever doing something like this, but again, just we want to say thank you on the behalf of the scribe and we're just so appreciative that you all can take out this time and really just show us your creativity as well as the constant hard work that y'all do. So without further ado, I'm going to be showing you all the winners for tonight. So just as a quick reminder, we have three categories. Um, let me just pull it up, it's lost in the chat. So the first one being the most uh, person who's been the most participative. Um, the second one would have to be the most um, thoughtful question. And then the last one, the person who had the best virtual background. So for the two people who had the most participation, congratulations to Chloe Lowe and Rhonda Reeves. Big major round of applause to y'all. The second category word of most thoughtful question goes to Alex Lee. Again, congratulations. And the last category word for best virtual background goes to Kayla Lee. Thank you again. Um, we hope you all had a great night and congratulations to the winners. Thank you again. All right, thank you to Joseph for announcing the winners. We'll be sending out the gift cards in an email, and we'll also send out a follow-up email to all of the people who RSVP to our event with a link to the uh, virtual exhibition. So if you'd like to share it, then it will be up uh, It will be up on the website for the next month, and you can access it anytime. You can share the links um, so other people can also look at the gallery. But thank you again to everyone for attending our event. I think we're a little over, but I think just right on time. So again, thank you to everyone for attending our event, and we hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.